with Dr. Doris Weddington at her home in Mooresville. Dr. Weddington, also known as Reverend Weddington, we appreciate the opportunity to interview, to the interview you today and hear the story of your life. We know that as a woman you have pioneered in several aspects of your life. Would you tell us about that, please? Well, when the 1960s came along, I had teenagers. And um, there were a lot of new things happening then and new doors opening. And um, as our young people were, were being very firm in their determination that everybody have opportunity and that some of the traditions of the past be put in the past and that new things start happening. In the 1960s was a time that things kind of turned around that way. And um, from the time I had finished high school when, in 1942, I was 16 in April and graduated from high school in May. And I had always wanted more education, not for any particular vocational purpose, but I liked what I found in books and wanted to find more. And um, but I didn't have any education past high school. I had worked as um, in textiles for a year, and then in um, retail stores. I worked in Teeter's Grocery Store on Main Street before there ever was a Teeter's supermarket on Broad Street, before there were any buggies to push. and. Um, and I worked in um, banks and, uh, and as a bookkeeper. And for about 16 of the 20 years between high school and college, I was a bookkeeper. And uh, we lived at different places. Um, primarily, I did my bookkeeping work in, in, when we lived in the city of Charlotte. And um, while we were living in Charlotte, Charlotte College came into being. The, um, the, jun the junior college. There weren't community colleges yet at that time. And it was a two-year college, Dr. Bonnie Cohn sponsoring. We're all familiar with the Bonnie Cohn story. Um, Dr. Cohn began speaking and promoting the idea that adults should go to college anytime at any age. And that was very fitting because Actually, Charlotte College began with offering education to the men who came back from World War II uh, using their GI Bill of Rights eligibility. So adult education, rather than just post-secondary, was a part of that college's heritage from its beginning. So I cut clippings out of the paper where she said, no matter what age, if you want to go to college, you can. And I kept thinking, you suppose that's really true? Nobody in my, in my family, I was a first generation college student, nobody in my family in the generation above me had um, college education. My parents had all that was offered to them, which was um, seventh and eighth grade education. We all know that they learned a whole lot more then than many of our high school graduates know today. <laughs> anyway, um, I was the youngest of five children and had been, this was 1962, and I had been married since 1945. Had two children, one in junior high and uh, one ready to start kindergarten. So my husband, being the absolutely supportive human being that he is, knew that I really wanted to go back to school, and when our, our second child entered kindergarten, I entered college. And uh, I was at that time 35, and that was very unusual at that time. But I was responding to those speeches and those articles that I saw from Dr. Bonnie Cohn that, you know, you don't have to say, I wish I had, I wish I could have. You do it. And so I did. And um, so I began at, at Charlotte College when it was a two year college as a freshman. and. Um, at the age of 35, 20 years out of high school. And um, I absolutely loved what I was doing. When you've lived that long and you have a curious mind, 
and and you're really interested in things, it's hard to turn a page in a book without finding something you've had occasion to wonder about sometime or other. And you're finding answers and challenges and new horizons. It was a, it was a real treat for me to do that. And um, so I went through the four years there. And then that four years, the college changed from Charlotte College to your college. Then they had one year with a junior class. Then they graduated one class from Charlotte College. And then I graduated in the first class from the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. So I was there through the entire transitional period and got to be chief marshal, which means I was the highest grade point average in my class three times by doing that. Congratulations. <laughs> there's somebody graduating there for three years. So, um, uh, but then when I graduated, I, oh, I was summa cum laude. Um, I, I didn't set out to do that. I just, it, everything was so interesting. And then after a while, <laughs> you've got a couple of years behind you with nothing but an A. It's hard not to get a challenge going <laughs> and see if you can make it all the way, which I did, and I was proud of that. Um, when I graduated, the college nominated me as their nominee for a Fulbright scholarship. And I... Um, uh, made my application. They didn't know they were supposed to do that because it was their first year as a university and they found out that they were supposed to nominate somebody when I had, and, and decided to ask me when I had 24 hours to get my application off. So 24 sleepless hours later I put my application in the mail. My husband had agreed, consented, had made arrangements that both children would go with me uh, to uh, London if I got it and I went through all the levels state district whatever regional and I received that scholarship and I studied at the University of London for a year studying um, medieval and Tudor drama or pre-Shakespearean drama and um, our son at that time was a, a drama major at the North Carolina School of the Arts and he took off a year and worked in the London theater for that year which was great experience for him. And the little girl attended a Church of England school, and she was uh, would have been in fourth grade here. And uh, so we had a good year. And again, there's Walter saying, you've earned it, go to it, go do it. He's always, always been there just supporting and saying go. Um, so when I came back, I taught uh, in Charlotte School, um, Independence High for a year. Then I taught for uh, about five years at Central Piedmont Community College, uh, teaching communication skills. And then um, I, res I had done some innovation, uh, some methodology that was really quite innovative. And as a result of that, I, I had been speaking and doing demonstrations and workshops all over the country, up and down the eastern seaboard and as far west as El Paso. And um, 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 I had spoken at a president's, president of community colleges uh, uh, convention, I guess, at, uh, in Austin, Texas. And then I received a letter offering me a full fellowship to the University of Texas to work on a PhD in educational administration. Again, my husband said, go for it, and so I did, and in 1975, I uh, received my Ph.D. in Educational Administration for the two-year college, for, uh, junior and, and community colleges. Um, I was looking for tissue. Okay. Uh, now, uh, this was was one of those things that, as, as you asked me to touch on the, the pioneering of women, um, the fellowship that I had was a government fellowship um, uh, specifically designed to enable women who had the ability and the potential to move up into uh, positions in the field of education that had pre previously been uh, occupied only by men. 
So that was an opportunity that came my way because of the movement of uh, women into uh, better opportunities, and the government supported that. Um, so when I completed that um, degree, I became um, an assistant dean of Catawba Valley Community College, it is now. And uh, after that, I was a dean at Rowan Technical Institute, which is Rowan Community College now. And um, uh, then I decided that I wanted to go back to teaching, that I was more of a teacher at heart than I was an administrator. So I decided I, want, I, I always wanted to do and always did work with remedial skills. Um, I figured that the bright students can get it given half a chance, but those that had difficulty learning needed extra help, and that's what I wanted to do, was to help somebody who needed help, and that's where I went. So I went into the Rowan County Schools and was um, a developed um, communications program for low verbal students, not... not um, uh, mentally retarded or learning disabled classified, but those that fall between the cracks. And at about that time the competency exam was coming and you couldn't get your diploma without passing the competency test. And that was new and it was very rewarding to have students come and say if it hadn't been for you I never would have gotten my diploma. You, you taught me what I needed to know to pass that test. I, I like to do that kind of thing. So. Um, I was there, and there I became um, um, assistant principal of uh, uh, North uh, Rowan High for instruction, to develop instruction and to help teachers be more individualized in paying special attention to students with special needs and individualizing what they do. That had been my theme all the time. And um, then I was coming up on age 60, at which time I would be, um, what's the word for it, funded, whatever, so that I could get my retirement? Invested. Vested. Invested. Vested. That's the word I was looking for. I would be vested and could get my retirement at 60. But when I was 58, I experienced a very distinct calling to the, to the Christian ministry. And um, again, you know, <laughs> there weren't many women doing this at that time. There were a few, but there weren't any women 58 years old going into it at that time. <laughs> but um, the calling was very clear and compelling, and um, so I pursued that and um, went ahead with it, took the required education, didn't do a full seminary program. I received a good bit of credit from the Methodist Church for the 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 uh, study I had done in the field of education in my graduate study. And I was uh, appointed to Jones Memorial United Methodist Church in Mooresville at the age of 60. And, no, 62, in fact. I served two other churches part-time before that, but while I was doing some study. Then at 62, I went to Jones Memorial. And I was there for eight years. and. Each of the churches that I served, which was three altogether, uh, starting at 60, um, one, each of them, in each of those churches, I was the first woman minister that they had had. And in each of those churches, as was true everywhere, in every church at that time, there were those who felt they just absolutely could not work here. And they and didn't have too much of... Um, I don't think it's right for women to be preachers. It was more, we don't think that can work here. The Methodist denomination is more on the liberal side as far as um, uh, quoting things that prove a woman should not be a minister. But uh, we've never had that, don't think about it. And in each case, I've, after not longer than two weeks, as far as I could tell, that idea was totally forgotten. It, they learned that it really doesn't matter. 
I remember I remember when we first had women on the anchor desk on TV. And I thought, this is strange. I don't think a woman's voice is going to carry right. No, it's guilty of the same thing. And yet now we would think it's strange if we didn't have women uh, doing the news and doing these things. So that's where we were. And um, the churches that I served, we were blessed. My work was blessed and the churches grew. Um, Jones Memorial had a membership of 110 when I went there and and after eight years, that's a pretty long time, but still it had grown to 206. And the attendance and the budget had more than doubled. And, and um, it was interesting for a first woman that it really doesn't make any difference, you know. If, uh, if the Spirit speaks to the minister and the minister speaks through the Spirit to the people, that's uh, what it's all about, and gender is not an issue. So, uh, let's see, one thing I didn't mention when I was talking about the community college. When I became dean at Rowan Tech, it's my understanding that I was the fifth woman dean in the state of North Carolina, full dean in a college. And, but I want, I want to say something about that. I have never been an activist in the sense of making speeches or carrying uh, banners or walking picket lines or I've, I don't put that down. My son is very much an activist for causes that he's concerned about and I admire him for that. But I just say it hasn't been my calling to do that. What I have wanted to do and feel that I've had some success in doing is find the opportunity, get the opportunity, step through that door and take a risk and then do the best job I can to give credit to what women can do. Your life certainly is a demonstration right. of that. More to demonstrate that women can do mm -hmm. than to talk about it. Mm -hmm. I just, know that that's been my role. I know that you served at Jones Memorial, which is an historic church in the Cascade community, and that you are working on a history of the church. Yes. And you, I think you said that you're not really prepared today to talk much about that, but we hope that in the future you will share that history with of Cas the Cas of the Cascade community and Jones Memorial with us. Right. The Jones Memorial Church grew up in the Cascade community and was just integral part of it. There would be no way to write a history of Jones Memorial Church without also giving the context in which it developed. And um, so the first portion of this history I have, I have written from uh, 1907 when the Dixie Mill was first established on that site to uh, 1938 when Burlington Mills had bought out that property and was in the process of selling. They, they repaired, painted, fixed up, put running water and bathrooms in all the houses and then sold them all to individuals. They didn't want to own a mill village. They didn't want the paternalistic situation that goes with the mill village pattern. And um, so that's where I have written up to. I have material. I started collecting materials when I went to Jones Memorial in, as pastor in 1988. I discovered that there was nothing and much of the information that I received by word of mouth turned out when I did my research to be inaccurate. It was, um, the meaning of it was right. They had the meaning of it right, but the dates and times and so forth had the names pretty well. They remembered who did what, but some, mostly dates were not all right. Um, the church was first Dixie United, no, Dixie Methodist Episcopal Church South. All Methodist ME churches had South on the end of them if they were below the Mason-Dixon line. So um, that was the official name to begin with. And, uh, just a touch on that, how it came to be Jones Memorial. 
the um, and a retired minister who was active in Central United Methodist Church named John W. That is John Wesley Jones um, was working with this community as an outreach mission Sunday school worship kind of situation. And he pulled it together and organized a church and, and it was um, officially recognized by the conference as a Methodist Episcopal Church in 1919. Then he immediately went about getting a building on property that had been donated by E.W. Brawley to the church. And um, while they were building the structure, he died. And the people between December 2nd, um, 1921, I'm pretty sure I've got the right year, and March, no, December, yeah, ni December 2nd, 1921, and March 1922, they had renamed it John's Memorial for him because he founded it and died while it was, the building was being constructed. So the church has a, a, there are a lot of churches with longer history. But this church has a rich history of uh, concern for one's neighbor, doing the impossible, things that could not have been done except by the support of the Holy Spirit, I guess is the way you could put it. One of my professors put it that way one time. What has your church done lately that could only have been done by the support of the Holy Spirit? And Jones Memorial has just done that repeatedly. They just uh, hang in there. And they're still a small church, but a very active and meaningful part of the community. We look forward to your your published book when you have completed it. Mm -hmm. One of the um, things... Go ahead. Uh, let me just follow up on that. I retired there at uh, from uh, the Methodist Active Pastoral Ministry in 1996. The Methodists have a mandatory retirement age of 70. And I reached that age in 1996 and retired. And then after that, I worked off and on some some breaks in it, but basically worked for eight years as a chaplain with the hospice of Ardell County. So that kind of the the uh, Brawley that gave the land for the original church there in the Cascade community. He was the individual that lived in the large White House That's exactly across right. from the. Creamery or National Guard Armory. Yes, and he was, uh, he and, I would have to refer to my paper to see, but several other, like maybe three other or four other um, uh, businessmen in the area um, started the Dixie Mill. But E.W. Brawley w it was the power behind mm -hmm. the movement to mm -hmm. start the Dixie Mill, to establish the community, gave the land for the church. I'm going to talk about the schoolhouse. You live on Schoolhouse Lane, and we know that back behind your house is a little building that was a black schoolhouse. Tell us what you know about it. Well, it was a schoolhouse for black children. <laughs> so, yeah, right. <laughs> it was, um, we, we don't know as much as we would like to know about it. That's, that's a research thing that I would like to get into. I've been to the Register of Deeds many a time working on the Jones Memorial and the Cascade history, but I haven't started delving on the schoolhouse and I very much want to know more about it. All we know is that it was on this property when my father bought this property from my husband's uncle, Locke Carriker. And the, old, the schoolhouse was there when Locke Carriker bought it from the previous owner, whose name I don't recall right now. Um, it looked in every way like it was a, at least turn of the century, that is, turn of the, 19th, of the 20th century. Um, the weatherboarding on it is literally falling off, literally. It was covered with honeysuckles. I'm not, no. Uh, poison ivy all over it up through the walls and all over the walls it was just covered and in, the interior is, was in good condition but the exterior was bad and we assumed it was um, uh, when we acquired it would have been in, was in the in the around 1970 
and we assumed it was probably 70 to 80 years old, but an individual whose name I don't know, and only one person said to my husband that he was living on this farm, that we don't own the home farm, but on the farm this came off of, when the schoolhouse was built and that it was in the early 1920s. And what was the name of the schoolhouse? The name of it is Sugar Bottom School. We have racked our brains for what could that mean. And the only thing we've come up with is there is bottom land between here and um, you mentioned that Brumley Road goes through to Linwood Road. Between here and Linwood Road there is a creek with some bottom land. And unless sugar cane was grown in that bottom land and that it came from that, we have it. cannot imagine where that came from. But, well, now we understand that sugar cane was grown in this, this area out here. Mm -hmm. And there's bottom land right down there. So I think there must have been a really nice sugar cane field down there in the bottom. Um, we don't know anything about who taught there. Um, I have an inkling that there were white teachers, at least one. I don't know who sponsored it. We don't know if it was a county school. There was a time when people, individuals, built schools, and, and I know of others. Was, was was this part of Rowan County at that time? I know it is now. Was it? It's Iredale. It was, oh, it's Iredale. Mm -hmm. I was thinking we, my, my, we're was, in Iredale. We're still in Iredale. Okay. We're about half a mile from Rowan County. Okay. And um, it's always been Iredale. Uh, well, Rowan, of course, stretched from here to the Mississippi at one time, but mm -hmm. but in any anything like modern times, this has been Iredale. It would have been an Iredale County School if it was a county school. We don't know whether the land was granted on contingency, that when it was no longer a school that they returned. We don't know if it wasn't granted. We don't know. And I would, if, if anybody has some information, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Albert, you have any other questions? Not, not at this time, no. Well, we have certainly admired your house and your wonderful antiques and your wonderful clocks. And sometime we're going to come back and talk about your house and and your and your clocks and and your wonderful collection of antiques. Okay, well, I'd love to have you come back any time. Okay, we'll we, we we look forward to it. We appreciate so much your interview today. Thank you so much, and uh, especially for sharing the story of your your life. You certainly have been a pioneer in many ways, and you've done many many things. And to start at age thirty five and be as successful as you have been is certainly a tribute to you Thank as a you. woman. There's one thing that I would like to have had on the tape that we didn't get. Well, we're still taping. Okay. I would like I would like to give the names of my parents. Okay. And um, my uh, siblings who live in who, or who who would be known by people in Louisville. Certainly. My father was Fred Kleiner, Fred H. Hamner Kleiner, and he was a textile overseer at Cascade Mill. And so I myself have some background connection, although I never lived there, have connection, and that's where I worked one year as in textiles. But um, he retired from textiles and went back to farming, which was the love of his life from youth, um, uh, at about the age of uh, 45. And, um, no, more like 50. My mother is Margaret Jester Kleiner, known as Maggie, and she's well known to a lot of people who've knew her at Bryan Center for several years, the last of her life. She lived to be 95. And my sister in Mooresville is Margaret Kleiner Carrigan. And people will know her and her children, Judith McLean and John Bell Carrigan, Jr. And Annette Moretz, she was when she was in this area, and at uh, Russo now. And I have two brothers, Horace Kleinert, who lived in Mooresville all of his life uh, until very recently. He's now in a retirement home in Hickory. And another brother, Ralph, who became a bomber pilot flying missions over Germany in World War II, stayed in the Air Force, 
and retired uh, to Florida uh, after his retirement years were done. And he now lives in Hickory in the same retirement center with his brother, Horace. And um, we had an older sister who lived in Mooresville only a short time, but her name was Opal Welburn when she was in Mooresville. She died, with, her name was Opal Elliott, and she lived and died in Virginia. Um, there were five of us born. The oldest one died two years ago, and the other four of us survive, and all four of us had a wonderful time at my 80th birthday party two weeks ago. That's wonderful. I'm wonderful. the youngest. So. That's wonderful. Well, we thank you so much again for, the, for allowing us to come and visit with you and make this recording, this videotape of the story of your life. Thank you. <laughs>